This is Science Friday. I'm Flora Lichtman, sitting in for Ira Flato. In the past couple weeks, the Cassini spacecraft made the first two of 22 planned dives through Saturn's rings. This is part of a dance that will end in the probe's fiery demise in September. And here to tell us about what Cassini is seeing and other science news from the week is Rachel Feltman, science editor at Popular Science. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. So what's the news with Cassini this week? Uh, So Cassini made the first two of its 22 dives, uh, which is really exciting because we've never had a spacecraft between Saturn and its rings before. And this mission has been going on for years and, you know, gotten so much important science about Saturn and its moons that might host microbial life. So it's just really bittersweet and awesome to to see the spacecraft, uh, you know, going through these maneuvers. This final final ballet. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's already, uh, you know, scientists are already picking up some really interesting data. Uh, For example, the spacecraft encountered a lot less dust uh, between the rings and the planet. Was that a surprise? Yeah. So they they knew that there wouldn't be big particles of dust, but they expected there to be a lot of like smoke sized particles. And they actually used the uh, spacecraft's dish, the antenna dish to kind of shield it. Hmm. Uh, But once they looked at the data from that first dive, they saw that there was almost no dust. Um, So that's an interesting thing for them to think about when they're trying to figure out the origin of the rings, which is something that is still not really settled. And the dust can be dangerous for Cassini? Oh, yeah. It's traveling at, I want to say it's 77,000 miles per hour. It's it's a lot. <laughs> um, so even tiny particles of dust, if they collide, you know, while Cassini is moving at that speed and hit just the right electronic part, it could completely ruin the spacecraft. Oh, wow. So, so what should we be looking for in the coming months from Cassini before September? Uh, There are definitely going to continue to be some really cool images. Uh, You know, we're getting closer to the atmosphere of Saturn than we ever have before. So we're going to see all of its weird storms, you know, that hexagonal storm. Yes, I saw that. Yeah, there's a lot of weird weather activity on Saturn that we don't totally understand. That blew my mind, the hexagonal (laughs) storm. I know, it's, it's wild and scientists don't really know how it it, you know, forms that regular of a shape. Uh, so yeah, we're going to see some some more close up images like that. Do you know when the next dive is? I want to say it's May 9th. It's definitely within the next couple of days. I so. will be marking my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what else do we have this week? We have a, a fun animal story. Yes. Um, so the western spotted skunk, which is a, a really fun animal. It's this little skunk lives across North America, um, and it does this really funny thing when it encounters uh, an adversary. Wait, it, this is not the skunk that, like, the Pepe Le Pew skunk. No. Slight, slightly different skunk. Very similar in a okay. lot of ways. Still, like, you know, shoots stinky <laughs> stuff at, at its uh, predators. But this one, it'll get on its hands and do, like, a running handstand to intimidate what? Uh, its adversaries. It's it, it it's supposed to make it look bigger. I think it kind of makes it look like a like black and white pineapple. But <laughs> um, I guess it works. Uh, but a reason scientists are interested in the skunk is that it's divided into several subspecies, you know, which happens a lot. Uh, species get divided by geography and breed only in within their own groups, and they form these subspecies. Is this uh, is called clades. Yes. Do I have the term right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, but those clades that exist today don't correspond to the things that divide them today. It's not like, oh, on this side of the mountain range you have one, and on this side you have the other. So scientists wanted to go back and figure out at what point in their evolution they split up and why. Um, They found that it was actually due to an ice age, uh, that probably they were separated by these glaciers, uh, and that that's, you know, where the subspecies that we see today originate, um, which is, you know, an interesting thing to think about as the climate is changing again. Well, I was going to ask, does that mean that we would expect to see more clades in the future? Well, you know, we already see different animals that are are definitely being driven to new places and, you know, uh, eating new prey and uh, exhibiting new behaviors because of climate change. So it's very likely that we're going to see different subspecies branching off because of the influence we're having on the planet. Hmm. Everyone should really check out the skunk and the handstand. <laughs> it's very cute. Do you have it on your website? Can yes. people see it at PopSci? It is at PopSci.com. It's worth it for the headstands, really. <laughs> um, okay, so what about this hacking, this uh, this this Google news. Right. So uh, yesterday, I believe, or maybe the day before, um, there was this very widespread phishing attack. Uh, 
basically hackers were trying to trick people into giving up their login information, which happens all the time. But this one uh, seemed really designed to target people who think of themselves as too smart. Like to, super, super users? Yeah, yeah. It was basically, it, it tricked you into thinking that someone was sending you a Google Doc, and once you click through, you gave permission to this third-party app and put your login in. But it was relying on the fact that people are so used to receiving Google Docs and clicking through uh, that Mindlessly. They, right, <laughs> that they didn't stop and think about it. Um, so it's just a really good reminder that, first of all, Google is not uh, infallible. You know, the, the spam filter is really good, but apparently <laughs> there was nothing to stop a, a hacker from naming their third-party app Google Docs, which <laughs> seems like an oversight. Um, so that's one thing to remember. And the other thing is that, you know, anytime you open an email, even if the initial thing doesn't seem... Uh, suspicious at all. It's important to think twice before entering your login info. Good to keep in mind. And what about our, you have one more story for us before you go? Okay. (laughs) What is it? Uh, So uh, Body Farm, which is basically these research facilities set up to study human decomposition uh, to help forensic scientists make better assessments of crime scenes, etc. One of them captured a deer eating human remains, uh, which has never been caught (laughs) before. This Um, is so morbid. It really is. Um, (laughs) This is like as dark as as we could end, really. Yeah. And, you know, in some ways, it's not surprising. We already know that deer are opportunistic omnivores and humans are made of meat. But it's still weird to think about and also gives forensic scientists uh, something new to look for when they're uh, studying crime scenes. What do you mean? What do you mean, like, look for deer with bones in their mouths or what? (laughs) Well, so the bone, the marks they left on the bone were very different from the marks you'd see from a carnivorous scavenger. Uh, So, you know, now if they see these marks, they'll be able to say, uh, you know, this this was because a deer ate the body, not because of the way they were killed, which is (laughs) morbid but important. (laughs) Thank you for being with us today, Rachel. Yeah, thanks for having me. Rachel Feldman is the science editor at Popular Science. Now it's time to play Good Thing, Bad Thing. Because every story has a flip side. Consider the spacesuit. These expertly engineered mini environments have been protecting astronauts from cold, heat, radiation, space dust, airlessness since the dawn of NASA. So it's a good thing that NASA has invested more than $200 million in developing new spacesuits over the last decade. But a new audit of this investment suggests not all is well. Here to explain the good and the bad is my guest, Lauren Grush, a science reporter for The Verge. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, of course. So what's the good news? Well, the good news is that NASA is thinking ahead and they are putting money into developing new spacesuits, which they're definitely going to need because they have very ambitious goals like going into deep space and onto Mars. Okay, so they're investing money. Um, and what's like? What's the most pressing spacesuit need that we have? Well, I mean, there are a couple. So NASA is hoping to go to lunar space or near lunar space, and so you're going to need a spacesuit for that. Um, Also, we have some new flights coming up of this new rocket that NASA is launching, and they're going to need not spacesuits for spacewalking, but suits just for the astronauts to wear when they're on those flights. And then, of course, like I said, want to go to Mars, you're going to need a special spacesuit for the Mars surface because it's going to be a very different environment than other places that we've been to in space before. That makes sense. So that all sounds, so it sounds good. Like we have a need, we're responding with money. What's the bad news? Well, the bad news is there was a recent audit of these uh, investments, and it looks like we are still many years away from getting new spacesuits ready for these deep space missions. And that's not good because NASA likes to do testing. And the best place to test these new spacesuits would be on the International Space Station. However, the International Space Station is set to end in 2024. And if those spacesuits aren't ready in time, it's possible we might not have the ISS to test those spacesuits out on. Ooh. I assume there are probably ways to test here on Earth. Yeah, but to really get a good test ground, you want to go where you're going to be, you know. It so, makes sense. It makes sense. Zero gravity is, you can't really get that anywhere else but in space. And I, I read that the Orion mission could happen 
as early as 2018 and and like the spacesuits would be ready months before or something? Well, so the, what NASA wants to do is to initial test flights of their new rocket, the Space Launch System. And the first one, for now, is going to be uncrewed. That just slipped to 2019. So it was going to be 2018, and now it's 2019. But um, the next one, which is scheduled for as early as 2021, that one will have crew on it. And that's the one where they're going to need suits, not just – they're they're suits that you use to ride in the Orion with. It's not like they're going out spacewalking, but just in case the Orion, you know, depressures are – depressurizes or there's some problem, you want to have a spacesuit on that you can, you know, that can save your life in a pinch. And um, those are supposed to be ready just a few months before the earliest date for that flight. So it could be kind of close for when those spacesuits will be done. However, if, you know, if the launch slips, it, they might have a little more time uh, to make those suits ready. NASA also got flack for investing $80 million in a project that had been canceled. What's the deal with that? So, um, you know, back before 2010, NASA was working on a return to the moon called the Constellation Program. And uh, they had all of these flights planned, and they were developing suits for that specifically. And then in 2010 or 2011, the program was canceled. Yet NASA still continued to fund the development program developed for the Constellation program for those spacesuits. And the audit was very critical of them doing that because there were a lot of recommendations to stop putting money into that program. Oh, to consolidate or something. Right, right. And so they ended up spending $80 million from 2011 to 2016. And they just now recently stopped. And it's... And Basically, the audit made it seem like they were squandering that that money. Thank you, Lauren. Appreciate yeah, you taking you. the time. Lauren Grush is a science reporter for The Verge. Coming up, tens of thousands of people will be watching the sun during the solar eclipse this summer. But what will scientists be watching for? We'll find out after the break. Support for Science Friday comes from Blue Apron. You know, springtime is a great time to hit the reset button and retackle personal goals like getting fit, cleaning, and cooking. And luckily, Blue Apron makes incredible home cooking easy by delivering seasonal recipes with step-by-step instructions and pre-proportioned ingredients right to your door, all for less than $10 per meal. You can even customize your recipes based on your preferences and select the delivery option that's right for you. Plus, there's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. And they are featuring some of my favorites this month in May. There's beef teriyaki stir-fry with sugar snap peas and lime rice. Three cheese and baby broccoli stromboli with tomato and oregano dipping sauce. And crispy salmon with roasted potato salad with pickled mustard seeds. Mm. So check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash science. You will love creating incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash science. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. This is Science Friday. I'm Flora Lichtman. I don't know if you heard, but the place to be on August 21st is Hopkinsville, Kentucky. At exactly 1.24 p.m. Central Time, the sun over Hopkinsville will go dark for exactly 2 minutes and 45 seconds. And that's because this summer, the continental U.S. will have its first total solar eclipse in about 40 years. The path of the eclipse will stretch from the coast of Oregon all the way down to South Carolina, and Hopkinsville will have the longest stretch of darkness. And there is a group of solar scientists who are pretty pumped about this, and that's because the eclipse is a chance to learn new things about the sun. So while tens of thousands of people will be staring up at the sky this August, solar scientists will be taking photos and even flying through it. What about you? Are you an eclipse chaser? Do you have a question about what you can see during the solar eclipse? Give us a ring. Our number is 844-724-8255. That's 844 844- Sci Talk or tweet us at Sci Fry. Let me introduce my guests. Shadia Habal is a professor of astronomy at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in Honolulu, Hawaii. And Matt Penn is an astronomer at the National Solar Observatory and principal investigator of the project Citizen Kate. He's based in Tucson. Welcome to you both. Good morning. 
Matt, are you there too? Yes, hi, Flora. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, thanks for being on. So w let's start with the basics. What do you need? What are the ingredients for a, a total solar eclipse? So shall I go ahead? Go for uh, it. So uh, the, the most important thing is for the moon to uh, totally obscure the disk of the sun, the very bright disk of the sun, so that the outer atmosphere appears because the corona which is the crown of the sun, is a million times fainter than the, the bright solar disk that we, that we see every day. So that's why we don't see the corona. So you really need to obscure it to be able to uh, make the uh, corona uh, come out. And Matt, when we need the moon basically to be exactly in line with the sun, is that, is that, a, yeah, exactly. is that a pretty good way to describe it? Exactly. And so, you know, um, you know, if, if you're thinking about your house, um, everybody has little specks of dust floating around, you know, in their house. And uh, you really can't see them normally. But if you have a bright light in a room and you block it out with your thumb, then the light reflects off of that light or source, uh, off of the dust and into your eye. So the same thing is happening during an eclipse. Um, the sunlight is reflecting off the gas in the atmosphere of the sun and into our telescopes. But we really need the moon to block out the bright source so that we can see it. I want to get back to the corona in a second. But before we do, I just want to go over some uh, more eclipse basics for people who, you know, citizens, citizens who are interested and might see it. Um, we, I talked to some eclipse chasers for a podcast that I host called Every Little Thing from Gimlet Media about the eclipse experience. And here's how physicist and eclipse chaser Frank Close describes it. And then the shadow of the moon is, is darkness. You see the night sky above you. You can see Venus and a, a couple of stars. And then as you come down towards the horizon, this dark dome turns into a deep purple and then a maroon. It looked as if life and energy and everything had been sucked off into the depths of space. In that moment, everything that you take for granted has suddenly gone. This sounded really intense to me. Matt, is that your experience of seeing an eclipse? Um, you know, some of what he describes is really beautiful, and I think the corona is a really beautiful object in the sky, but when the sun goes away, it's just, it's wrong. The sun's not <laughs> supposed to go away, you know? Um, it's scary. So, yeah, it, it is, and, and you know, I like to think of it, if you're a rabbit and the shadow of a hawk passes over you, you know that something's wrong, you know, you're about to be eaten and you need to run. Um, and so maybe that's a similar uh, feeling that we have is uh, as the shadow of the moon passes over us, we get some sort of primal urge and some realization that this is wrong. Mm. I, I feel very compelled to see it. Shadia, you are an eclipse chaser yourself. Well, yes, I do it for science. Yes, yes, for how scientific many, purposes. How many have you seen? Uh, well, I've tried to see 14 and uh, we were clouded out uh, by four. So I would say I've seen 10 eclipses. And my experience is slightly different. I don't find it ominous. I just find it uh, awe-inspiring. It's an incredible uh, sensation when you, you see uh, the corona appear. I mean, this is what's so fantastic. All of a sudden, everything dims, and then you have this gorgeous uh, aura of light around the sun that just comes out, and you have the impression that the streams are going out to infinity. Mm. And w we can't usually see that, right? It's too bright. That's right. The disk of the sun is way too bright, so you have to block it, as Matt was explaining, to be able to see this outer atmosphere because the intensity of the disk is a million times uh, more intense than the surrounding corona, so you really need to block it. And what scientific questions are you interested in about the corona? So uh, what's puzzling about the corona uh, that was discovered in 1869 also from a total solar eclipse was the fact that it's actually a very hot atmosphere. The surface of the sun is around 6,000 degrees. Uh, it has dropped from the center where you have nuclear fusion uh, from 10 million to the surface uh, of 6,000. And then all of a sudden the temperature starts to rise. Now the what? difference is wait 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 yes it gets hotter as you go yes. farther away from the center yeah no as you go farther away from the surface from the surface so you go from the center to the surface it drops and then it starts to go up again that's so puzzling and, yes so that's the biggest puzzle and we're st still trying to figure out what are the processes that are allowing this gas to all of a sudden get hot. Now, mind you, that gas is very, very tenuous. So the density is much, much lower than the surface. So 
let's say it's like sticking your hand in an oven without touching the you know the uh, racks or anything so you feel the heat but you really don't burn yourself however because of this very high temperature you have some uh, uh, some elements in uh, in the corona for example all the elements you find on earth iron chromium nickel whatever they have been stripped of uh, a large number of electrons because it's so hot and as they're losing all these electrons and they get ionized and excited they emit a certain light of a certain color so we try to capture this light to be able to get some clues as to what's causing uh, this hot corona so the light you can trace back from the colors that you pick up to understand better what basically what's happening you know what chemical processes are happening yes we try to do that that's what uh, that's what we yeah that's what i'm doing i've saw some i saw a picture that you created it was just beautiful really it's a nice yes. it's a nice product of the data it's really lovely thank you <laughs> um matt tell me about citizen kate oh yeah so citizen kate is the citizen continental america telescopic eclipse experiment and so now you see why we call it Kate. Um, <laughs> but the idea is to spread identical telescopes across the entire continent and during the eclipse to take data um, to look at some science uh, questions. Um, we have volunteers across the country and they range from um, middle schoolers through high schoolers up to you know, retired um, solar physicists who are going to operate the equipment. And then a key part of the experiment is that after the uh, eclipse is over, um, the various groups get to keep their equipment and continue on with other uh, astronomy projects uh, using that in the future. And what do you want them to look for? So, you know, the corona is a mystery, as Shadia was mentioning. Um, one thing that we think is we're, we're going to see in our data are these polar plumes. So above the north and the south poles of the sun, we expect to see these um, really thin threads of gas, uh, which are constrained by magnetic fields. So what we know is happening um, from our observations from space and from the ground is that at the bottom of these plumes, the gas is not really moving very much. But at the top of these plumes, about two solar radii, um, we know that the gas is moving about 60 miles per second. It's really flying. Um, this is part of the solar wind, this, uh, this uh, flux of particles that comes from the sun. I was going to ask, um, is this the same as solar weather? Is this like a, a variety of solar weather? It's, it's a type. And you can think of um, a, a terrestrial analog. So... Uh, if a storm comes along on the Earth, you need to understand the wind that's blowing it along to be able to predict where it's going to hit and what, what it's going to do. Um, so the sun emits flares and, and basically storms in the solar wind, and the solar wind carries it um, throughout the solar system, and it may impact the Earth. So one of our goals is to understand how the solar wind is accelerated to get some basic understanding about how we can then predict solar weather better or space weather better. Hmm. And citizen scientists will be helping with this effort? That's so cool. It's, it's a real team effort, and, and I'm just really enjoying working with a lot of the people. A lot of people, of course, are volunteers. Uh, many are students. Um, they're getting to use some really interesting equipment, and you, know, you can tell they're excited about it, and they'll get to experience the eclipse as well. And then it's a win-win. Um, we get a unique data set as scientists to understand the eclipse and the, the processes in the solar wind that we wouldn't get otherwise. Let's go to the phones. Janet in Hillsborough, Virginia, you're on Science Friday. Do you have a question? I do. I'm wondering, to be able to look at the eclipse and view the corona, do you need any special viewing equipment? Just a good pair of sunglasses or just with a naked eye? Can you watch it? <laughs> oh. Yes. Um, <laughs> go for it. For totality, okay. what you'll need to use are some special solar viewing glasses. So regular sunglasses won't work, but when any part of the bright solar disk is visible, you need a special glass, uh, solar viewing glasses to protect your eyes. Um, but it's key that when totality happens, that is when the last bit of the bright sun is covered up, you can take off these solar glasses and just look at the corona with your naked eye. It's, it's about as bright as the full moon. Are these things going to sell out? Like, do we need to get, get our glasses in order now? <laughs> yes, Probably, definitely. yes, yes. Did that answer your question, Janet? Where do you buy them, on Amazon, or where can you find glasses <laughs> like this? <laughs> um, uh, I think Rainbow, Rainbow Symphony is one uh, one source. They, they, it's a company co that sells them. It's called Rainbow Symphony, so you can look them up online for all your a, for yeah. all your uh, your solar eclipse needs. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> um, Matt, I heard also that you were going to put together like a super cut. Actually, maybe the the opposite, a director's cut of the eclipse from some of the 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 photos and movies you were getting back from your team of citizen scientists. Right. So the idea is that at any one location, like you mentioned in Hopkinsville, you'll see the corona for about two minutes. Um, but by having a string of telescopes across the country, it'll take 90 minutes for the shadow of the moon to move from Oregon to South Carolina. And so if we can stitch together the data from all of our telescopes, we'll be able to observe the dynamics and the changes in the corona over a 90-minute uh, period of time. So, um, yeah, after the uh, I'll be in Idaho, but after the eclipse is over there, uh, I'll be in a little dark room trying to get data from all of our uh, various sites and stitch it together to form a, a rough cut movie that night. Will I be able to watch it on YouTube? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Shadia, w- I, I heard that, that um, people were, would be flying through the eclipse. Can you describe what, what that's about, what the goal is, and have you done that? Uh, I haven't personally done it, but I in 2015 we had a, a a small group from my team who were on a on a flight over close to the Faroe Islands because uh, the totality also went uh, over the North Atlantic and over the island of Svalbard. So we were on land on Svalbard, but the people who were on the plane uh, got to see it. It's uh, uh, of course, you're above the clouds, but then it's very difficult to collect data because of the very slight vibrations in the aircraft, even though, you know, they were reduced with some uh, gyros and whatnot. But there is a a, a, a NASA uh, airplane that's going to fly uh, above the clouds uh, to observe the, to collect a, a, a spectrum of the sun uh, during totality. And this is to maximize the chances of obtaining observations because the biggest fear is to have a cloud or to to have rain during totality. So when you go in in uh, above the clouds, then you maximize your chances, but then it becomes much more expensive because you have to take uh, to make s- uh, special provisions for the jitter in the aircraft. Mm. I'm Flora Lichtman, mm. and this is Science Friday from PRI Public Radio International. Shadia, can you study the sun by simulating a solar eclipse in the lab or by observing other stars? Uh, simulating? No, you don't. You can't do it by simulating. In the I guess lab. I mean, uh, like, could you l- take a telescope and block out the sun oh, yes, and look at yes. the corona that way? Yes, yes, of course you do. And this is what's done in uh, most uh, space-based uh uh, uh, telescopes that look at the sun in the visible part of the spectrum, the part that we see with our eye. and uh, But the difference between those and the total solar eclipse is that this blocker that they use, which is a man-made blocker, is fairly small. And then it, it doesn't uh, see the beauty of the eclipses is you start to look at the corona from the solar surface out to several, several solar radii. With a man-made occulter, you are limited to the distance range that you can cover. So sometimes you lose, lose details that are uh, you can only see during a total solar eclipse. Let's go to the phones again. J.D. from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Welcome to Science Friday. Yes, hi. I'm an avid listener, first-time caller. Um, I've got an interesting story. When I was uh, way back in high school, uh, a little solar eclipse of 71, 72, I don't remember exactly what year. I was so enamored with the solar eclipse that came across uh, our little South Georgia uh, town, Hinesville, Georgia. I set up a a mirror in the back of my mother and father's jewelry store and rebroadcasted the sun's eclipse onto a a screen where you could see it, you know, not having looking directly at it. And, uh, again, that's what made me uh, get all enamored with all things solar and then later to become... Uh, which now I'm a retired renewable energy executive, but uh, that's what got me all all renewable energy. That's what made me Solar Man JD. Wow! And, uh, it was all because of it was all because of that total eclipse that we got to view in the '70s, in early '70s there in South Georgia. Oh wow! Will you be going to see the eclipse this year? Well, I'm going to do my best to. I'd love to be able to, but I will be watching uh, because I believe the doctor there is going to be doing a live, uh, a live simulcast of his of his group that's going to be doing it. So I will definitely be watching the live simulcast, and all the young children uh, that needs to watch it and see it, and hopefully 
some of those minds will work the same way that we had that, 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 that impressed on me at such a young age to go into uh, all things solar. I love that idea. Thanks, JD. Sure. Matt, I, that mirror trick, I'd never heard of that. Is there any, um, like, fun things that people can do during the eclipse or, or things that people should plan to do during the eclipse? Oh, yeah, certainly. Um, if you have a, a pinhole um, in just a piece of cardboard, you can project an image of the sun onto something um, and, and see the crescent during the partial phases. But you don't really need just a pinhole. Um, during uh, the phases where there's just a little bit of a crescent left, um, any shadow looks very strange. So you could hold up your keys and see that they have little crescents uh, where normally they would have straight lines and edges. Um, you could uh, um, look under trees and see uh, an array of little crescents projected onto the ground rather than uh, normal sunlight. We're going to have to leave it there. We've run out of time. I'd like to thank both of you. Shadia Habal is a professor of astronomy at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in Honolulu, and Matt Penn is an astronomer at the National Solar Observatory and principal investigator of the project at Citizen Kate. Support for this podcast comes from Tile. What if you could find anything in seconds? Well, now you can with Tile, the tiny Bluetooth tracker that makes finding your things easier than ever. You simply attach Tile to your keys, your wallet, your laptop, even your bike, anything you don't want to lose. Then when something is misplaced, find it easily. Just open the free Tile app on your phone to see your lost item on the map, then quickly find your item by making your tile ring, and it'll be back in your hands in seconds. And if it's your phone that's missing, just double press on your tile to make it ring, even on silent. Every day, over 2 million lost items are located with tile. So join the millions who have used tile to help find their lost stuff. Get yours today at gettile.com Friday and save up to 30% per tile on a multi-pack, plus free shipping. And because Tile makes the perfect gift, for a limited time, get a free gift box with a multi-pack order. Go to gettile.com slash Friday. That's gettile.com slash Friday. This is Science Friday. I'm Flora Lichtman. Every so often, people living in the upper latitudes get a celestial treat, the aurora. It's also known as the northern or southern lights, depending on your hemisphere. But last year, something unexpected happened. Aurora chasers in Alberta, Canada, saw a weird thing in the sky, a purplish streak, maybe a kind of aurora, and they named it Steve. Of course they did. My next guest helped create an app that connects observations made by citizen scientists with space weather researchers hungry for aurora data. It's called Aurorasaurus. Joining me now is Dr. Liz McDonald, space plasma physicist at NASA and founder of aurorasaurus.org. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. What is Steve? So Steve is a great story. It's um, something that was observed across uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, um, and was given a, a different name initially. It's a very thin purplish kind of arc that can go across the sky yeah, in the like, east-west direction. It looked more like a, like a Francesca to me. <laughs> yeah, and it sometimes has a little bit of green to it as well, and it's quite a bit further south than where most of the aurora occurs, and people who are enthusiastic aurora uh, chasers, just like eclipse chasers, uh, they actually um, captured it uh, when they were out looking at aurora that was Uh, in Canada, much further north. And they said, what is this thing? And initially, uh, it had a different scientific name um, that uh, myself and other scientists uh, do not think is accurate for it. And so um, through citizen science projects, and uh, we've been connected to some of these uh, um, enthusiast groups that are organized on Facebook and Twitter. Um, Alberta Aurora Chasers is the one that discovered this phenomena. And we had conversations with them um, about how this is not likely to be what the common name was, which was Wait. a proton arc. So they, they basically, the Aurora Chasers had identified it as a proton arc and connected with you guys and then found out that, no, it's not a proton arc. It's something different. Yeah. Yeah. They connected with... Um, our team at Aurorasaurus and also scientists at the University of Calgary. 
And uh, they just came up with a new name for it. It's actually based on an animated kids movie from Canada uh, <laughs> where some uh, characters don't know what something is. Uh, it's, it's like different animals and they go, oh, that just let's just call it Steve. And so <laughs> this group is really uh, fun. And they said, let's call it Steve for a while and collect more observations. And that's really where this became really exciting to document that Steve is actually not a one-time thing. It's a scientific phenomena that can be um, dis- uh, documented in a rigorous way through citizen science is, and further Steve, investigated. Is Steve an aurora, though? Like, what is Steve? <laughs> so uh, we are still working to figure out what is causing it. Um, it is uh, a long way further south than most of the normal aurora, um, and it's probably excited by light. Uh, most are, is excited by particles from um, uh, way further out in space, following the Earth's magnetic field lines and hitting the upper atmosphere and causing some light. Um, and so there are a couple that could be happening with Steve, um, or it's possible that the upper atmosphere itself is chemically exciting some of the light here and that's something that we're still piecing together some of the satellite observations and some of these really interesting um, uh, DSLR camera observations to um, further understand as well as other uh, ground-based camera observations uh, scientific observations. Tell me about this why that did DSLRs did basically citizen scientists help find it? Mm-hmm. Like, was it in the sky before and just we didn't see it because we weren't looking in the visible range or something? Uh, we've been looking in the visible range, but not um, in this uh, location, which the technical term is sort of sub-auroral. But really what this means is, you know, across the U.S.-Canadian border kind of latitudes. And the scientists... Um, uh, missed it largely um some people had seen it but it hadn't been published that we know of yet wow and yeah and it's pretty obvious in a dslr camera (laughs) and um there are other cameras um across canada there is a great network of auroral cameras um but they're generally further north because that's generally where the aurora is and now um the sun's activity actually drives aurora And it gets more active every 11 years. And so the last few years have been more active, more aurora has been seen at these more southern latitudes. And now people have better cameras, they have smartphones, they have Facebook and Twitter. And so all of these things together have combined to really help us um, connect in in unique ways and improve our understanding of the system um, and make a discovery really um, with people's help or much better understanding of this rare kind of aurora. That's cool. So what is there a simple way to describe how an aurora is formed? Uh, well, normal aurora, as I said, is driven by the sun, starts up from the sun. Um, one way I like to describe it is um, uh, thinking of like a glue of charged particles coming from the sun. Um, and a what of charged is... particles? We may have lost you for a second. A, a glitter bomb. Oh, I'm so glad that we asked. Uh, a glitter bomb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the glitter is actually all invisible um, until the very end of this chain reaction that causes the aurora. And, uh, and it travels an enormous distance. It travels 93 million miles out from the sun in all directions and sometimes uh, hits towards Earth where it interacts with the Earth's magnetic field region. And there it gets really complicated uh, as far as how the interaction occurs. Mm. And eventually that energy is released um, in kind of an oval shape at the high latitude regions where it then creates the light of the aurora and all of this beauty and dynamics that you can see. Why does it only happen at at the poles? Um, So that's because of the way that... uh, the Earth's magnetic field is largely shaped like a dipole magnet, um, but it gets uh, the dipole actually gets stretched uh, away from the Earth-Sun line uh, because the Earth is kind of uh, sitting in the flow of the solar wind, streaming past us at a million miles an hour, and so all this glitter is coming um, 
towards the Earth's magnetic field uh, region and streaming past us and streams towards the um, uh, is processed through the Earth's magnetic field region and ends up uh, stimulating aurora from regions closer to Earth that are still a long way away, hundreds of thousands of miles, and um, at these high latitude hmm. field lines. <laughs> Before we let you go, are there are there like any big aurora unsolved mysteries? I guess besides Steve, uh, there are a lot. Um, it's it as I said, a lot of the processes are happening um, from starting um, from a hundred hundreds of thousands of miles away and actually this dipole magnet of the earth's magnetic field really stretches very dynamically and very quickly and that's what causes uh, most of the aurora to be so active and there's a lot of that um, specifically how it connects uh, way far out in space that is very difficult to study um, from the number of spacecraft that we have in those regions. I'm really glad that you gave us the glitter bomb analogy. I will never look at an aurora the same way. Thank you, Liz McDonald. <laughs> Liz Thank you very much. And thanks to all the citizen scientists who have been contributing to Aurorasaurus and other projects like this. Liz McDonald is a space plasma physicist at NASA and founder of Aurorasaurus, aurorasaurus.org, and you can download the Aurorasaurus app, too. The Atacama Desert is one of the driest deserts on Earth. Like, it, it actually makes Death Valley look lush in comparison. In the Atacama, you can look around and not see any living thing. No animals, no plants, nothing. Unless, that is, you know where to look. Joining me now to talk about that hiding place for life is my guest, Michael Wing. He's a science teacher at Sir Francis Drake High School in San El Selmo, California. Welcome to Science Friday. Good morning, Flora. So tell me about this life form that lives in this very difficult-to-live place. Yeah, I will. Th thanks for that introduction. I'm also the author of the book, Passion Projects for Smart People, published by Quill Driver Books. It's coming out this summer. Cool. So hypoliths are rocks in the desert that have green stuff growing underneath them. The green stuff is cyanobacteria and algae. The rocks are usually quartz or marble, so they're translucent. They transmit a little bit of sunlight through the rock to the underside. And it's better for the cyanobacteria down there. They get protection from ultraviolet light, and it's a little more humid under the rock. So if you turn over a white rock in almost any desert in the world, including polar deserts like Antarctica and also mountaintops, you very often see a bright green film on the bottom side of the rock. That's the cyanobacteria? That's the cyanobacteria, and, and usually there's a little bit of green algae mixed in. So when conditions get too extreme for plants and animals, these are the last life left standing. And the name comes from the Greek, hypo means under and lith means stone. Hmm. And so that's where you find them, under stones. And will any rock do, or do you need a special kind of rock? Uh, you need a special kind of rock. You, you need a rock that will transmit sunlight to the underside. Uh, there's one exception to that, but in general, the rocks are quartz or marble. Uh, the one exception is on, uh, in some uh, polar regions, especially Devon Island in the Canadian Arctic, uh, frost heaving kind of lifts the rocks up out of their sockets and, and light can get down underneath an opaque rock. And they need the cyanobacteria, I, I take it, need the light to live. Right. They're photosynthetic. They need sunlight, but they can get by on as little as one-tenth of one percent of direct sun. And they'll get fried if they're on the top side of the rock? What's, why not live there? Uh, that's correct. I, I took some home from the Mojave Desert and put them on my classroom windowsill, and they just got bleached by the sun and died pretty quickly. So you've been running an experiment to try to understand these hypoliths better. Tell us about it. Well, in 2010, my students and I started putting arrays of fake stones in deserts around the world. We use glass and marble squares from a tile supply store. and They're the, the kind you might use to tile your bathroom or your kitchen. So we roughen them up with sandpaper to make their surface more natural, engrave <laughs> our names and the year on them, and then we put them on the ground in sets of 60. So we've been doing a couple of these a year, and now we have um, arrays of these what we call artificial hypoliths at 10 sites on all seven continents. So we have them on Devon Island in the Canadian Arctic, Svalbard, Antarctica, the Mojave Desert, California's White Mountain Peak, 
the United Arab Emirates, the Atacama that you just mentioned in <laughs> Chile, Australia, Namibia, and last summer I put some in the Himalayas, specifically on a high mountain pass in Ladakh, India. Uh, and the I, idea. <laughs> oh, I want to hear more about that, but let me just do an idea. I'm Flora Lichtman, and this is Science Friday from PRI. Um, it sounds like you've gotten to travel to a lot of cool places. I have. I love deserts. De deserts are beautiful no matter where you go, whether they're polar deserts or, or hot deserts or mountaintops. And it's been a fantastic excuse to travel, and I'm very lucky. Science Friday actually got a chance to visit one of these experimental sites out in California's Mojave Desert. So Chil yes. Garcia, Science Friday's um, education program assistant, was there and is here with us now. Welcome, Sochi. Hi, Flora. It's well, nice to be here. Hi, Sochi. Hi, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to visit one of these sites? Walk us through it. Um, so Michael gave us a set of GPS coordinates <laughs> in the Mojave Desert. So we drove out, um, and it was three of us that went out there. Ariel Zitch, who, who's our education director, actually co-wrote this resource with Michael. Um, and so we went out to the desert, and we um, tramped out. We parked on a random side of the road, and we walked in towards this sort of uh, and bouldered up to this area that kind of looks Mars-esque. I don't know if, if I'm exaggerating <laughs> that, but you, it looks like you're on a Mars landscape, and you have to search for this small square patch of white tiles. The bathroom tiles. <laughs> the bathroom <laughs> tiles, um, like Michael described. And then um, we actually got to uh, dig a couple of those up and document the data from those. And so um, it was pretty amazing. And then Michael advised us to go out randomly and drive to a different place and walk out and just pick up white rocks. And it turns out when we picked up those white rocks, there were cyanobacteria on a lot of them on the underneath. So you can find them naturally and you can find them in these artificial hypolis, um, these experimental setups that Michael and his team has put out. Was it easy to find the tiles? No. <laughs> the, <Good>. the, <laughs> and that, that is good. We actually had a couple minutes around there where we were searching and we, we were like, oh, my God, maybe mud washed through this basin and covered them up. So we had a little bit of time freaking out. But then uh, we, we happened upon um, we triangulated. There were three of us. And so we went in different directions and were able to find the site. So it's it like a treasure great. map. It sounds like a real adventure. It, it was. I really, really enjoyed it. Michael, do you have other people checking on these? Who does most of the checking in on these sites? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and, and, and not only the checking in, but also the deployment. Um, I have, uh, most of these sites are near some scientific field station. I can check on the Mojave sites and the, and the, the other California sites myself. But uh, all these sites except one, I have local contacts for. Cool. So if people want to get involved, can they go to the Science Friday website? Sounds like sciencefriday.com slash rocklife. Do I have that right, Sochi? Yes, that is where you can find the resource and also connect with Michael. So we have his website up there for this project. Um, and on the Science Friday website, what we've done is on Science Friday Educate, we're trying to connect learners with the data and the real field work. And so we've put up um, some of Michael's pictures as well as ours from three different sites, um, the Mojave, Devon Island, and the Namib Desert. And you can go through and look at these and grade them on a scale that Michael has created for the cyanobacteria growth. Um, so it's a pretty cool way to get into the data and the climate science. Very cool. That's all we have time for. I'd like to thank Michael Wing. He's a science teacher at Sir Francis Drake High School in San El Selmo, California. And Sochil Garcia, she's the Science Friday Education Program Assistant. Thank you both. And for any New Yorkers listening today, Science Friday is hosting its third annual trivia night at the Bell House in Brooklyn next week on Wednesday, May 10th. There will be drinks, prizes, and a lot of fun science trivia. You can find out more info and reserve a spot for your team at sciencefriday.com slash trivia. Charles Berquist is our director. Our senior producer is Christopher Intagliata. Our producers are Alexa Lim, Christy Taylor, and Katie Heiler. Rich Kim is our technical director. Sarah Fishman and Jack Horowitz are our engineers at the controls here. At the studios of our production partners, the City University of New York. You can email us. The address is scifry at sciencefriday.com. And you can find me at my show. It's called Every Little Thing. That's Gimlet Media's geeky podcast. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. I roughly...